Thank you, everyone. Welcome back to our Bible class. Before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our verse, and then the book. Let's pray. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity and the freedom to assemble together so that we can know you more through your word. We know how important this is. And so we'll just take a moment of silence and use 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This gives us the opportunity to recover from broken fellowship, thus enabling us to have the influence and the empowerment of God the Holy Spirit as a result of confessing our sins. So let's just take a moment of silence and pray, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity once again to assemble together with, as believers in Christ. We know the, vi the, re the reason for this, the importance of this, and so if there's anything bothering us or vying for our attention, we'll just lay those aside for the hour so that we can focus on Thee, focus on Thy Word. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, before we get into our verse today or tonight, um, I'd like to ask that you all keep Theta and her family in prayer. Apparently her uh, mother had passed away the other day, early in the morning. And so, as you know, when you lose someone of family status, that is very difficult and very challenging. And so, um, let's keep her and her family in prayer as they go through lo the logistics of uh, taking care of all those things that need to be taken care of. So I know that she is um, going through hardship right now, so please keep her in prayer, Theta. But we know absent from the body is to be present with the Lord as those who are believers in Christ. And so uh, I have had the opportunity to share Christ with her for numerous times when I was there in California. And so I don't doubt that she'll be in heaven as a result of her faith in Christ. And of course, with uh, Theta being a believer as well, she, I'm sure she's had an opportunity to share. That's our hope that we have in Christ. And so that's why we do what we do, because we never know when it's going to be our time. And so please keep them in prayer. But in the meantime, let's look at the verse for tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are. And this verse is taken from John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. Here it is, right here on the screen. Which says the following, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So let's make some observations here and see what you can see. And if you'd like to comment on this, just unmute your mic and please do so. What do you see here? As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Anything here that you guys see? That to believe in Jesus Christ. Right. Very good. And when you believe in Jesus Christ, what happens, Rudy? Very good observation. You become... You're adopted and you become a child, children of God, child of God. Very good. Yeah. So, so you can see based on the verse itself, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So receive, another way of seeing, another way of saying receive is to believe. So believe parallels receive. Receive, believe, right? You see that there. So I, I jotted down a few things here as well. But before I share my notes, does anybody else want to say anything based on this verse? As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, does anything stand out to any of you? Small verse, but uh, a number of things here that we can point out. So, well, let me share what I have here. The phrase, this phrase, as many as received him, indicates that salvation is available to anyone who receives Christ. 
You see that right in the opening, as many as received him. So it's available to anyone and everyone. So it's not based on works or merit, but on faith alone. That's why I said the word believe parallels receive. Anyone who believes in him is the same person who receives him. See, to receive him means to believe in his name. Something else to point out is that it says, to them he gave the right. And that word right is ecusia, which implies authority or power. So you've been given the authority or the power to become children of God. So this suggests that becoming a child of God is not something we work for or we achieve, but it's a status, a status granted by God himself. So that has been granted to you, granted to me. That's our new status when we believe or when we receive Christ. It's a new status. We're a citizens of the heavens. You know, uh, so to them he gave the right. And it goes on to say to become children of God. That's in the second half of verse 12. To become the children of God, this refers to the new spiritual birth. So not only does John 3 talk about being born again or uh, being receiving everlasting life. And that whole passage is about being born again. And I've said before, it's the only chapter, chapter in the Bible that talks about being born again. But here, John 1.12 talks about, it hints to the spiritual birth because it, we're, it's talking about becoming children of God. You can't be a child of God unless you have a spiritual rebirth of some sort, a spiritual birth that comes from the divine. So I'm a child of my parents and so I'm, by nature, I'm human, right? So when we become children of God, that kind of hints or implies a spiritual birth, thereby allowing us to be, be sons and daughters of God, children of God, right? So to become children of God refers to the new spiritual birth, as seen here, to become children of God. But the, the act of being born again is highlighted in chapter 3 of John. But this verse, in verse 12 of chapter 1, talks about becoming children of God. That's referring to our spiritual birth, which is going to be the result of John chapter 3, two chapters down from chapter 1, this verse, chapter. So this talks about becoming children of God, the new birth, and it's by to those who believe in his name. So this clarifies what it means to receive him. That's why I said earlier it parallels to receive um, or to believe parallels receive. So to those who believe in his name, it clarifies what the word receive means, right? Belief is equated with receiving Christ. So belief is simply trusting in Jesus Christ for everlasting life. That's all it means. So it's not about a commitment to being good or changing your life. It's all about, just in the one verse here, it's by believing in his name. That's all it is. So if, we, if I was going to highlight the, the several points here, there are four of them actually. So point number one, the phrase, as many as received him, that indicates that salvation is available to anyone who simply receives him. So that's point number one. Point number two, as I would pointed out, is that to them he gave the right. That's the second point. To them he gave the right. The first point, as many as received him, that phrase indicates salvation is available to anyone and everyone who would receive him by faith. And those who would receive him, anyone and everyone, to them he gave the right. And that right, ecusia, implies authority or power. The word right hints to authority or power. So in other words, <clears throat> becoming a child of God is not something we work for, or not something we achieve, but it's a status that's granted by God himself. He granted us the status to become what? Children of God. Okay? 
So that's um, point number two. And point number three is to become children of God. And that hints to being a new spirit, that hints to our spiritual birth, adoption into God's family, children of God. That is a gift and it's not earned through good efforts, not by being better, not by sinning less, but by becoming a child of God. It's related not through any good efforts on our own. And it's given to those who simply believe in his name. That's identifying our focus on the person of Christ. This clarifies what it means to receive him. Belief is equated with receiving Christ. That's what we get here. Belief is simply trusting in Christ Jesus for everlasting life. That's all embedded in the one verse. And that's what happens when you comb through it and you have a study based on one verse at a time. And when you look at the verse closely and unpack what it means, then you walk away with the true meaning of the text. So sometimes it's better to go one verse at a time rather than going through a hopscotch of myriad of verses because now you have to, you have to focus in on, you know, so what people do today is they'll take eight or ten verses and they'll say, the Lord said this, the Lord said that and bring eight, ten passages together. And so you're hopscotching around these verses. And again, there's nothing wrong with using verses to um, show what the doctrine means or something along those lines. But the difficulty here is that if you take all these verses and you kind of bring them all together, then you don't have the liberty to slow down and interpret the verse closely like what we're doing here. See, this is one verse and unpack. You, you see that there's a lot of things here. The nature of being born again, the nature of receiving and believing, meaning one and the same thing. The adoption is found in this verse and it's being children of God. And so that's why it, it's, that's why uh, good seminaries in America are so focused on teaching Verse by verse, a, a literal, uh, literal hermeneutic that is consistent with what the Bible says. And we're losing this today, unfortunately. We're losing a lot of this today. So, and that's what we're trying to do here through our studies. We're trying to um, preserve some of the things that were taught yesteryear. And to keep it going. That's why I've said numerous times, I'm always trying to find others who want to study the Bible with me and learn what I've learned. And then you can take that and teach others in your periphery. You can te teach this in home, your own family members, your own friends, so that you, you walk away with a... A meaning that's consistent with what the, what was taught several years ago and the years prior to that. These gentlemen, these men who studied with their entire lives and they've invested numerous lives studying the grammars, the, the original languages so that people would walk away with nothing but the unadulterated word of God, which is what God wants us to do. It's almost like going back to Mount Sinai and, and getting the tablet straight from God. And so we're trying to do that. I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to stick with what I've learned and pass it on to the next generation, the next group of individuals that want to ta ta take this responsibility and guard it with their lives and teach it to others so that their kids' kids would be able to have something that will be rooted in Bible doctrine, rooted in God's word, not any of this fluff that people are teaching today where it's just tickling the ears and sounding good and it's devoid of any substance today. And that's why I think you'll agree with me that when we're looking at the text together, hopefully you're learning something and seeing that there's something different with our studies because it is different. I'm not going to say that it's like everybody else's. I, I, we lose people. Sometimes they, they don't like it because it's not 
like what they're accustomed to, which is really easier. So anyways, let's go on with this. And if you have any other questions regarding this verse, we can talk about it at the end. I'd like to just move on so that we at least get the, the, the study uh, under our belts tonight. So this time we're looking at the spiritual gifts, page 85 of uh, Pastor Gene's book. July 16th is the date today. And uh, we're on page 85. Here's a copy of the book. So if you don't have the book, I'm now uh, posting it here because I find that it's easier for me to take his information, post it on the notes, and then I'm going to give you <clears throat> my two cents as far as what the spiritual gifts is all about. Like, like I said, the, the strategy has been to challenge you guys to come up with your own study and preparation. What could you come up with for the subject of spiritual gifts? And this one's a little bit harder. It's not easy. It's not like salvation or anything like that. It's a little bit more complex. So mine is a little longer at the end, but I'm going to take us through what Gene has to say about spiritual gifts. A lot of what I have to say piggybacks on what's already written here. So, But some of what I'm saying is um, kind of I'm expounding a little bit more than where he left off. So it, it's one and the same, but just a little bit more clarification on the subject of spiritual gifts. So here's what it says on page 85 of the book. The phrase, the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 2, 18. So he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit and spiritual gifts. Has to do with the indwelling of the Spirit at salvation, Romans 8, 9. By contrast, the gifts of the Holy Spirit refers to the unique enabling by the Spirit of God to the individual believer for specific service such as in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It is important to understand that no one can possess a spiritual gift until they first receive the gift of salvation by faith. They receive the gift um, of the Spirit indwelling the believer. So let me just, I, I think I went through this rather quickly, so let me just make sure you see this, that the, the title is from the very opening, he says, the gift of the Spirit and the spiritual gifts. So the gift of the Spirit and the spiritual gifts are not the same, they're distinct. The gift of the Spirit is the gift of God himself at the moment of faith, and spiritual gifts, on the other hand, is that unique enabling by God the Holy Spirit who indwells you, and he enables you particular gifts for each and every believer. Okay, so my gift is the pastor teacher as detailed in Ephesians 4 and we're going to cover some of this tonight. So the gift of the spirit and spiritual gifts are distinct. So now um, I'll pick up where I left off. It is important to understand that no one can possess a spiritual gift until they first receive the gift of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ which includes the gift of the Spirit indwelling the believer. So the moment you believe in Christ, you receive that gift of everlasting life, but you also receive God, the Holy Spirit, who indwells the believer. That's the last sentence right before the unifying power of spiritual gifts. So that's very important. You, Every person, every believer has at least one spiritual gift. Some have two, maybe more. But you all have at least one spiritual gift. And if you don't know what that gift is, then you could be, you can hang around other believers as you get into the Word of God, whether it's in a church context, a Bible study context, and be around other believers who will at least be able to see what your enable, your, your particular strength is. So a lot of times it's seen by others who will say, you know what, you have just a way with words. You have a way with encouraging others. You just have a way with teaching the word, clarifying things and making it easier. So these things are, are discovered in a, in a context of other believers, surrounded by other believers. So that's usually the first thing that is, uh, that's the first place I would suggest if you're trying to find out what your gift is. 
So now the unifying power of spiritual gifts, all spiritual gifts are sovereignly bestowed by the Holy Spirit. So every gift that's available in a local church, in a local study group, it's all given by God, the Holy Spirit. It's supported by 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, 12, verse 11, 12, verse 18. Okay, All gifts are under the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find this in 1 Corinthians 12, 5. The effects or results are given by one God, the Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians 12, 6. Because the family of God is the body of Christ on this earth, spiritual gifts empower each member to play the part God designed for them. All gifts work by the same power, which is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. All are de designed to edify the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12:7. Ephesians 4.12, that's the focus. It's designed to edify the body of Christ. And all are to ultimately glorify Jesus Christ. So not only are they designed to build up the church, but it's ultimately designed to glorify Jesus Christ. So as you're empowering and build, building up others, you're involved with ministering to others, whether you're teaching a, a class of some sort or encouraging other younger folks or just your presence. It's designed to edify the body of Christ, which will ultimately glorify Jesus Christ because now you're stewarding your spiritual gift. So now let's look into the definition of spiritual gifts. There are 20 gifts mentioned found in Romans 12 as well as 1 Corinthians 12 as well as Ephesians 4 and then 1 Peter 4.11. Some of these gifts were temporary and ceased with the early church. 1 Corinthians 13.8 through 10, Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. These uh, citations are focused on the gifts of the Spirit. And if you're interested, I would encourage you to read this because it's good information regarding the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. Then you have uh, each believer receives a spiritual gift at salvation and the reason why is to enable him or her in his own area of service. So once you're enabled with, by God the Holy Spirit through a gift of some sort, now that gift is to enable you in your own area of service, whether it's teaching, whether it's encouragement, whether it's helps. Whatever that gift is, it's designed to build up the church. And so you, when you refrain and you hold back, you're not edifying the body and now you're in disobedience to God. And not only are you in disobedience to God, you're no longer at, you're no longer glorifying Jesus Christ. So you should always use that when you have that opportunity to do so. Point number three, though the believer may fail to utilize his gift, he cannot lose the possession of that gift. Romans 11:29 talks about how get all gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So the idea is that you don't lose that gift if you don't use it. You know, the saying goes, if you don't use it, you lose it. Well, not in the spiritual realm. Once you have a gift, you don't lose it. But if you don't use it, it doesn't glorify God. It doesn't impact the believer. It doesn't impact those around you. Maybe you have a gift, and so now you can impact the people in outside of a church context, meaning you can extend grace to others. They can see and capture Christianity by your spiritual gift. That might be the gift of helps. And so you may be exercising the gift of helps, which really technically should be in the context of a local body, whether we're talking about a Bible study group or a church group. We, I believe you can use that gift outside of the church too so that you can bring honor and glory to God because the scripture says by their, your works, you'll be able to um, squelch and... Um, Stop the unbelievers, the unregenerate. So, and they could see, uh, by your works, your relationship to God. By your works, they can see that you're disciples of mine. There are multiple passages that talk about bringing, bringing honor and glory to God, projecting your relationship with God, uh, based on your own relationship, based on your gift that you have. It doesn't have to stop just in your own church or your own Bible study group. 
you can certainly impact the people around you. They can see the niceness about you, the grace that exudes from your words, your choice of words, and that could draw people to Jesus Christ just by your actions, by your words. So though the believer may fail to utilize his gift, he cannot lose that possession, the possession of that gift. Romans 11, 20. I've quoted that numerous times, especially when it comes to salvation. You can't lose a gift or a call. So the gift, of course, is everlasting life. You can't lose that. So that's Romans 11, 29. And point number four, the spiritual gift is identified by growth. Ephesians 4, 12. Developed by spirituality and preparation. 2 Timothy 1, 6. And so as you're preparing, as you're, pre as you're in preparation and as you're, let me see how he words it here, developed by spirituality. So that's the idea of using your gift, spirituality and develop and preparation. So you're exercising your spirituality and you're preparing, meaning I, I would take that link that with the studying of God's word, 2 Timothy 1, 6, and is exercised out of love for him, Christ, and his body, the believers, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. So you can see the combination there is <clears throat> as you're exercising your spirituality, as you're walking in grace, and as you're preparing, that means you're studying the Word of God, studying show yourself to prove, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth, because even though you're walking by means of the Spirit, uh, the filling minister of the Spirit. You still have to prepare. You still have to study. You still have to make sure you're ready to teach. You're ready to lead a, a Sunday school group. Uh, you're ready to lead an usher group or whatever the case may be. You still have to prepare for that. And that's found in these verses, 2 Timothy 1.6, 1 Corinthians 13. The love passage, it shows how we're interconnected and how we're to uh, build each other up. Those are all important. You see that? And then Ephesians 4, uh, 15 to 16. All of this is just uh, pinpoints the importance of preparation, utilization of what God has given to you. It's never for your own benefit. Gifts are always for the edification of those around you, your fellow brother or sister in Christ. And so when you have that opportunity, seize it. Use it. Point number five, spiritual gifts must be distinguished from personal talents. So some of you have natural talents. You're just smart. You have a high IQ. And that's not the same thing as a spiritual gift. So it must be distinguished. Where talents are natural, gifts are supernatural. So you might be smart in a, in a, in a humanly realm, but the, your spiritual IQ might be way down there. So you have to distinguish between natural talents and supernatural gifts. So you might be able to say, for example, teach a leadership class because you're just smart in that area. But that's not the same thing as teaching God's living word or Bible doctrine. So that doesn't require IQ. That requires <clears throat> humility, grace, Consistency in God's Word, trusting in the living Word of God. The Word of God is alive and powerful, recognizing that it's not through eloquence or speech or wisdoms of uh, words, but through the empowering ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 recently. And so when you are anchored in His Word, then the supernatural gifts start to shine. And then people not start to notice that there's you just have a knack for certain things. And so it can be distinguished from natural talents. And if you can't, then you yourself need to do the observation. Because maybe those who around you may not be able to tell right away because you're just so good at what you do that they can't distinguish whether or not that's on your spiritual side or your natural side. Then I would say you be the one to observe. Because you know what is naturally yours because you worked hard over the years. And then there are certain things that you know that it has to be the grace of God. It can't be your doing. So you will have to step back and uh, look at yourself and see what those gifts are, the natural gifts versus the, the, the natural talents versus the gift that has been bestowed upon you. 
So if others can't pinpoint it, then you'll have to pinpoint it because inside you know what those natural abilities are and then you know those things that God has um, enabled you with. He has given you a gift and so maybe you are the only one that's going to be able to discern what's natural and what's not. And I don't mean that others can't. I'm just saying that sometimes I've seen people where they're so smart, for example, they've got like a medical background and they're just really, really intelligent. I'm thinking of a guy who was in our Irvine church many years ago. He was a, a doctor and he was very, very smart with a number of things. But when, and so he couldn't discern what his gifts were. And so we started talking and several of us started talking and we agreed to pray that he would be able to see what those, what his natural talents were and his spiritual gift. And it turns out that he was able to see that he was just, his, his regular IQ, his human IQ was very up, very much up there, but his gifts were in the area of helps. He, because for a while he was thinking he's supposed to be a pastor and it turns out he was, he was a deacon. And so he was a deacon, he was smart, but he, he thought initially he was going to be a pastor. And so because he was so smart, people were thinking, yeah, maybe he is a pastor, but it turns out he, he wasn't called out to be a pastor. He wasn't cut out to be a pastor. He had the smarts, he had the human IQ, but he didn't have the gift of pastor teacher. And so when he consulted several of the men to pray for him that God would give him wisdom, and then we were just able to pay close attention to him and help him, so once he, once we knew that he was really seeking, then several of us were just really paying attention and we would just make the observation, knowing that he really honestly wanted to find out if he was called to be a pastor and if he was going to sit under the pastor that we were under. And so it didn't take long for him to find out. Plus, we found out too, based on interaction with him, that although he knew the Bible, he did not he didn't strike us as someone who was pastor material. So we collectively, and then in the end, even though we were about to tell him, you know what, you're not cut out to be a pastor, he confided in us and said, well, I don't think I'm a pastor. Um, so it, it worked out. He, We found out, we just prayed and sensed that he wasn't a pastor. And as we were about to approach him, he quickly told us before we told him that, no, I, I found out I'm not pastor material. So that's what I would say too. If you don't know, make the observation on yourself and pray and consult with several people because they'll be quick to observe. They'll pray with you so that God will give clarity and then um, it'll come to pass, I believe. Yeah, so that's in case you are looking and you want to know. So number six. It is important for the believer to seek to identify and function in his or gift, in his gift, for it defines a plan of God for his life and is the basis for which he will be judged for reward. 1 Corinthians 3, 3, 10 to 15, as well as 9, 17. Faithful exercise of a spiritual gift makes a life makes our life a living sacrifice as per Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, or offer up your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. So once you find that spiritual gift, that becomes your reasonable service. That's the least we can do after all that he's done for you. He saved you from the lake of fire and now he saved you from multiple things in the past. You know, he saved your life multiple times in the past. And so now you have every reason to serve him as your reasonable service. You offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service as per Romans 12.1. You execute Romans 12.1 as a result of renovating your mind, Romans 12.2. So those two work together. They're never to be separated except if you're going to exegete one or the other. One or the other to focus in on why you should serve. It's because it's your reasonable service. How to be not like the world anymore? Well, you renovate your mind. That's verse 2. So displaying the measure of God's grace to us, Ephesians 4, 7 to 8, and the measure of our faith in Christ as per Romans 12, 3, all the way down to verse 8. 
So now I'm going to give you my outline of spiritual gifts on top of what uh, Gene has in his book. A lot of this is overlaps, but I'm going to expound on a few things that he didn't cover. So definition and purpose of spiritual gifts are special abilities given by the Holy Spirit to believers for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. He says that too. 1 Corinthians 12, 4-7, same passage. Now the purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ as per Ephesians 4.12. He mentions that in one of his set verses, his points. Types of spiritual gifts. There's what's called motivational gifts, found in Romans 12, 6 to 8. These motivational gifts include prophecy, they include serving, they include teaching, exhortation. Exhortation is encouraging someone. Giving, some have the ability to give more than others because God has blessed them in a way that's monetary. Leading and mercy. Leading is just leading a group, leading in an administrative sense. Leading in, in one way or another. There's multiple ways you can lead. You can lead a youth, lead a, an adult group. There's a number of things, uh, but that's the sense when you look up motivational gifts. Then there's the manifestation type of gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 8 through 10. These include the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, close but slightly different. Wisdom is just the ability to, you're wise in a point where right there on the fly, you need, it's kind of like when uh, Solomon said, well, uh, they're both claiming it's the same child. The child belongs to her and the child belongs to her. Cut the baby in half. And so that's wisdom right there. So some people have that gift. The word of wisdom and some have the word of knowledge where uh, it, it's the result of having an uncanny ability to um, s explain a verse from the Bible. Faith, some people have the ability to just trust God in spite of the circumstances and the Bible talks about some having the gift of faith. Just ultimate confidence in God. It's a way of Encouraging others, so God gifts certain people with faith, it seems to me. And then there's gifts of healing, which I think has ceased. It's no longer... Now, let me just say this. When I say gift of healing is, has ceased, I'm not saying that God doesn't heal today. Of course He heals today. But in the New Testament, there were some people who, who were gifted to be able to pray for specific people, and healings would take place right there as a result of that ambassador. So that a particular ambassador, that particular servant had the ability to pray and the person would be healed. And so there were gifts at that time, manifestation gifts, that were um, there in the early church. I don't think it's available to us today. I don't see any particular person that can go to the hospital and say, you're healed. Uh, you're deformed, you're healed. You got cancer, you're healed. You got your autism, you're healed. We don't see this today. So I, I do believe that was part of the manifestation gifts during that time in the early church was to advance the cause of Christ and to bring attention to the Messiah who has arrived. And so there were manifestation gifts that included uh, gifts of healing, speaking in tongues. But those kind of gifts have ceased now because of the completed canon of Scripture. So I don't believe some of these gifts are available today. There were gifts of miracles, gift of prophecies. So people were able to zoom in and see down the road what would happen as a result of uh, the fact they were prophets. They can prophesy. They had the, Some had the gift of discerning of spirits. Some had different kinds of tongues. They could speak in another language. And some had the ability to interpret tongues. So if someone would speak in tongues here, like in the Corinthian church, they, had, they were speaking in tongues. Paul said, don't do that unless someone was there to interpret. Two or three at the most, but someone has to be there to interpret. So there was a protocol. There is an order. And so today, you just see church, ah, blah, 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 going all out of control. That is contrary to the word of God. Two or three at the most. Whatever happened to that? If they were really biblical tongues, 
then they should slow down and listen to what the Word of God says because the Word of God is authority and don't ever go fall for the thing that, oh yeah, but the Spirit is leading. You can't stop the Spirit. The Spirit will never violate His own Word. So if the Spirit of God says two or three at the most and one interpreter, then the entire church is at odds with God Himself. The author of Scripture says two or three at the most and one interpreter between when there's tongues. I've been in churches before where they would just all stand up, let's praise the Lord, la, 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 and you know, you can't stop the spirit leading, and that's not the spirit in that church. You never find the Holy Spirit violating his own word, and that's why you always bow the knee to the authority of Scripture, no matter how much it feels like there's something going on there, I can feel the Spirit move. No, you don't. You don't feel the Spirit moving. You feel your feelings moving. And just because 200 people are chanting, that's not the Spirit of God. Why can I say that? Because the Spirit of God would not violate His Word. So you might be, if you're listening to this recording in YouTube later on, or if you're listening now, and you're get, taking offense to this, I'm not too concerned about you being offended I'm more offended I'm more concerned about offending God don't ever 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 say well you know the spirit is moving that person doesn't know what they're talking about what do you mean the spirit is moving you never ever ever say the spirit is moving when it violates the word of God it never violates scripture so if the, if the church is in compliance with the word of God then they should not be offended when they see what the word of God has to say so you always bow the knee to God's word, never to a room full of people who are chanting tongues, tongues, tongues. And I've seen that before, and that's more of an anathema to God himself. And that's not that's blasphemous. You never take his word and say, God said this, and he's moving in this church. No, you take the authority of God's word. And I'll t let me tell you this. I've read some books on ex-witches who are now Christian, they would say a lot of these Pentecostal churches, I'm not saying all the Pentecostals are wrong, but these Pentecostals, these former ex-witches who were serving Satan would say in their, their books, who are now Christians later on, that they used to go into churches that are Pentecostal and speak in tongues and blaspheme Jesus Christ on the cross. And there's no way you could determine that because everyone was too busy speaking in tongues. So don't tell me if they're, the church is speaking in tongues that that's the Spirit of God moving. No, not at all. I don't buy that. I would rather listen to people who are ex-witches who are now converted Christians who would tell me that when they were serving Satan, they used to go to churches where they could not be discerned from another member of the church and the best places to do that was in a Pentecostal or Assemblies of God church. I'm, I'm quoting you now that these people who were ex-Satan worshippers thrived on going to Assemblies of God and Pentecostal churches so they can mock and blaspheme Jesus Christ during the church service. How were they able to do that? When the pastor was speaking? No. When everybody in the entire congregation was speaking in tongues. Because when that's happening, there's no interpreter, everybody's going off, blah, 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 blah. And now, the only one that is grieved is God himself. So please don't tell me that the church is speaking in tongues. No, I, I don't buy that at all. There is no tongues today. The scripture makes it clear the canon, of, the canon of God's word has been completed. We have everything we would need in multiple languages. We don't need tongues for today. Now, I will say this. Can he speak in tongues? Can he empower someone to speak in tongues today? I will say, of course he can. Why? God can do anything he wants. But is that probably the normative today? No. Why? Because in every denomination... Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, I would like to see at least a small percentage of that in every denomination. 
Otherwise, God has violated his word because God said he has no favorites, correct? No favorites. If that's true, then why would a small segment of Christianity called Charismatics, Assemblies of God, Pentecostals, why are the only ones, why are they the only ones that speak in tongues? Why not the Baptists? Why not the Roman Catholics? Why not the Methodists? They don't have them. So then God would be guilty of violating his word by having favoritism with specific denominations. So I'll stop there or else we'll keep going on and on and on. We won't be able to finish this. So minister gift mentioned in Ephesians 4.11. These include apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. Distribution of gifts. By God the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts are distributed by him, the Holy Spirit, as he wills. As he deems uh, were, were, as he deems, as he wills. 1 Corinthians 12.11 Every believer receives at least one spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12.7 supports that. Function of gift. Unity and diversity. Although there are different kinds of gifts, they all come from the same spirit and are intended to work together for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12.4-6 addresses that. Edification. Spiritual gifts are given for the edification of the church. 1 Corinthians 14.12 Service. They are intended for service within the church and beyond. What do I mean by that? So in the church, it's designed, spiritual gifts are designed to empower, to exhort, to edify, to build up uh, the, the members of the body of Christ. And for those outside, it's designed to take the gospel... We're all called to do the work of an evangelist. He gives us boldness. He gives us the ability. He brings to remembrance those things that we prior, previously studied so that we can impact, impact, impact those around us. We're never told to be lone rangers and just keep it to ourselves. Why would we? Why would he want us to do that? If we don't share, if we don't make it a point to advance the cause of Christ, we're no good and he's just going to wind up taking us home. It might as well uh, be worthwhile and do something for his cause. Otherwise, he'll just take us home early. What would be the purpose for that? We would get no rewards. We would not be able to serve him. So, advance the cause of Christ. That's the edification of the church and beyond. The exercise of gift, point five. Exercise of gifts. In love, spiritual gifts must be exercised in love. First Corinthians 13, 1 to 3 talks about this has to be done in order and in decency. I mentioned that earlier. The exercise of spiritual gifts should be done in an orderly and decent manner as per 1 Corinthians 14.40. Then recognition and use. Recognition. Believers should recognize and acknowledge their gifts as per 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy 4.14. And then you have the misuse or the use. Believers are encouraged to use their spiritual gift as per 2 Timothy 1.6. And then point number seven, you have the spiritual misuse and, and correction. Misuse spiritual gifts can be misused, leading to division and confusion. You find this in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 30. And then you also have uh, the correction. Paul provides corrective instructions to ensure proper use as per 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. So in summary, spiritual gifts are divinely given to you and to me, distributed by God the Holy Spirit to believers for the purpose of building up the church. These gifts vary but are all intended to work together for the common good. They must be exercised in love and in order, recognize and develop for effective ministry and service. Misuse of gifts can lead to disorder, hence the need for adherence to scriptural guidelines for their proper use. So that concludes our study. So let me open it up now for any thoughts, comments, questions. Just unmute your mic and uh, I knew we were going to be able to finish tonight. So glad we were able to finish on time. So make sure we'll, we'll close on time too. Any thoughts on the study or my notes here or first uh, John one twelve? Well, I, uh, I have a, you mentioned a favoritism. Yes. 
I think in our in in our present time, mm -hmm. as a parents, we cannot say that's my favorite son because I think uh, because he has to be equal. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, when God is as an apostle, so we should practice that too. Yes. That's how God is. So I think uh, when we see when we say that is my favorite <laughs> child or yeah. son, yeah. we are already feeling. Mm -hmm. You're right, and Rudy. Pardon me? You're, you're right. Uh, that, yeah. well, you know, in the context of uh, God's word, he says that specifically to show us that God has no favorites. Because God is just, God is loving, and that's the uh, primo example of love and grace. He has no favorites so that there would be no disunity, no hurt feelings. He's just grace, he is love, God is love, right? So, yes. but I will say this. The truth is, and um, in some homes, in some families, some parents, they have... They do have favorites. If they have several kids, they might they might have a favorite. Maybe they get along with that son or daughter more. And so um, I know parents like that. And so we uh, that's just the nature of how love works sometimes in some family units. But um, I think if we get stronger in doctrine, God's word, and if we know God doesn't have favorites, then that becomes easier for us to follow suit, right? So maybe a parent doesn't know that God has no favorites, for example. And so as they mature, then they might say, oh, you know what? God doesn't play favorites, so maybe I shouldn't do the same. Maybe if I'm going to follow him as best as I can, I better not have favorites, you know? So... Some, sometimes that's a maturity um, component that has to take place in that person's life. Because if we say, Rudy, you're not supposed to have any favorites, then now I might drive you away. I might, you know, let's say you come from a background of uh, Roman Catholicism. And so now I'm trying to win you to Christianity. And I say, Rudy, you know, God doesn't have favorites. And then the Bible says this. Now I'm pushing you away. You might say, well, if Christianity is like that, that's too legalistic. That's too rigid for me. I'd rather stay Catholic. So, but I know... I'm trying to understand, trying to understand how to explain it to them. Yeah. You know, as, as an equal for children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we could explain it clearly to them. Right. With the confidential with the influence of the spirit. You're right. Second, if we try to find our special spiritual gift, we will know it mm -hmm. because we'll be enjoying it. Mm -hmm. We will be bl not blessed. And how do I start? We will enjoy doing it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're right. But if we try, but I think most of the people who study the Bible, they're always looking forward to be a pastor or a teacher. Yeah. Not realizing that you're not. Yeah. Yeah. But they forcing their flesh. <laughs> yeah. Instead of letting it sink in. Right. What is the gift? Mm -hmm. I think that identification of that gift that we're looking when you enjoy it. Yeah. Like when you're teaching and you enjoy teaching it because you you are lifted and right. the Holy Spirit is with you. And, I think that's the key. Yeah, you're right. If your gift is serving the church, mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's say putting the the hymn book on the on the pew. Yeah. I know you will enjoy doing that. Yeah. And if you enjoy greeting the people, and that's your gift. That's what. That's how I could identify you. Right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I just, uh, Susan, I answered your question. Uh, yes, every person has at least one gift. Every person has a gift. So you have a gift, at least one, and possibly more, but at least one. Every person here has at least one. So as I pointed out in some of the... I have a question, Pastor. Okay, Ruben. Yeah, regarding the gift of teaching, 
I bought a piece of like that. Mm-hmm. So how can I, I don't know how to explain then the Romans 9.13? Mm-hmm. Romans, yeah. Romans 9.13? How, how, how to explain the Romans 9.13 then? What does that say? Let me look at it. Romans 9.13. Okay. Let me open it up real quick, uh, Ruben. What is it? Romans 9.13. Okay, R- Romans. Oh, yeah, the Aisah. Let me see. So, so what does what mean, Pastor? Is that playing favorites or, or what's going on here? Let me. See. I'm trying to re- see if I can read um, before this regarding Esau and Jacob, right? Yeah, yes, Pastor. Okay. So I think this has more to do with the nations that are being chosen here, not necessarily individuals or more of a um, nations, context of nations, it looks like. Let me see if I can, I'm trying to delve back into the um, context here. The nations of Israel and Edom, it seems like there seems to be more of a Related to the the nations, not individuals. So let me see. So it's um. That play favorites or something. I might have to save this for next week. Um, I, I can't find anything that stands out clearly to me here. Um, okay, Pastor. Ruben. Good question, okay. because on the surface it would look like there's something here, but I think this has more to do with nations, um, because it has to do with Israel and Edom. But, uh, let me, let me dig a little bit more and answer it correctly, because, um, I don't have the answer right now. So I, I think there's, okay, I think there's more to it. There's more to it than just the two names here, I'm sure. So can I answer it next week, next Tuesday? Okay, okay. Good question. Romans 9.13, I'll save that. Anything else that's a little easier for me? Good morning, everyone. Hi, Susanna. Good morning. Yeah. Um, actually, it's not a question, but I have just this um, thought, you mm-hmm. know, as I was always saying that, uh, you know, my background. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Charismatic and uh, uh, speaking in dance is widely used as a, a show or... Spiritualism. To show that the Holy Spirit is... Uh, we were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I was doing that actually until such a time that I heard you teaching it. Mm-hmm. And, and it enlightens me, right? But then I have just get these thoughts. Why did it spread uh, to many, to so many charismatic groups? And uh, how did they arrive with this kind of thinking that uh, that's one, although it's one of the sign, but uh, why did uh, I'm just confused? Where mm-hmm. did this? Where did they get this kind of idea? Mm-hmm. And then it spreads a lot, so something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's a good question. I, I don't have a pat answer for that, but I think some people are more inclined to be driven uh, to things like that, I would say, because um, I was kind of enamored by the Assemblies of God when I first got saved because my background was Baptist General Conference. And so when my friend took me to her church, it was more of a Pentecostal thing, and I was wowed. I said, wow, this is this is different. And so that kind of 
captured my attention. And so I, I got caught up in it. But then I was trying to get tongues. I was trying to speak in tongues and I couldn't. And so I would tell my, I would ask my friend, you know, um, I'm a little dis- discouraged because I can't speak in tongues. And so she took me, she took me. I remember, pa- I right. remember pastor one time you said that, uh, somebody, uh, some pastor laid their hands yeah. on you and, and something like that. Yeah. Several of them laid hands on me and I was really wanting to speak in tongues. And so they, the pastor had several of the men lay hands on me. And I wanted it, and he just said, roll, open your mouth and roll your tongue and just let it come out. And my eyes were back, and my my mouth was open, and, you know, I think everyone praying out loud, their saliva went into my mouth. And I just, but I wanted it so badly, I sincerely wanted to speak in tongues because that church did. And so I st- I went home still a little discouraged, and I went to my pastor who was... um you know, where I was originally from, very conservative, did not speak in tongues. And, you know, Susanna, I that put me on a quest from that point on to study the Bible. And I wanted more because I was I was not too sure what to believe anymore. That that kind of got me so discouraged. Um, I was questioning my salvation and so from, I think I was uh, 17 years old, I went into, uh, I started to be involved with my church more and more and more. But I was still in the back of my mind confused. Why could I not speak in tongues? I went into the ministry in my conservative church. I became a pastor. But I knew that I, in order to settle my questions in my soul, I needed to get some kind of training behind what I was doing because I didn't know anything. I was, because I didn't speak in tongues, I thought I was losing something that someone else had. I didn't have the gift of the Spirit, so I was afraid. And so I wound up going to seminary, um, and my pastor at the time, who was conservative, said, well, you don't need that. You, you're, you're saved already. You believe in Jesus. I said, yeah, I know, but I just need to know for myself because something's missing and I don't know what that part is. So I wound up going to seminary and for several years I went to seminary and I pursued scripture and it was through the opening um, of God's word that I realized that I do have the spirit of God and it's based on me being baptized into the church, into the body of Christ as per the Holy Spirit. And so once I started to connect the dots that it isn't about speaking in tongues, but it's, it's about receiving the Spirit, that was, that was the missing link for me. I, did I have the Spirit or not? Because for me, if I didn't speak in tongues, I w- didn't have the Spirit. And so after vigorous intense studying of the Holy Spirit and the very first eye-opening book for me was Lewis Sperry Schaefer, He That Is Spiritual. That was the very first book that opened my eyes and I realized that there's different conditions for man, a natural man, a babe in Christ, a spiritual man. Then I realized, Susanna, that speaking in tongues is not the answer to being a uh, spirit filled or to be baptized in the spirit because to be baptized in the spirit is to be enjoined to the body of Christ not not necessarily not um, experienced by tongues because there are numerous people in the Bible who didn't speak in tongues and so why do people um, do this today I think it just draws certain people. I think, Susanna, certain people are drawn to it, and so they feel like this is what it means to be a Christian. They speak in tongues, and there's, their, their disposition is more inclined to be like that. And so I knew I was, but it wasn't through the opening of God's Word and a consistency in His Word that it transformed me from the inside out. 
to fully persuade me that speaking in tongues was not the mark of someone who was born again. Because in the end, I really, the reason why I was seeking is because I was afraid I was not saved. I didn't want to lose my soul for all eternity. So for me, it's not about, um, okay, Susanna, let's see. Yeah, uh, hopefully that made a little sense, Susanna. I, I know I go off and ramble, but um, you're totally, uh, I, I hope that made a little sense. I'll try to work on something because that's something that's very important to me too. I'll work that into an article or something or maybe into one of my books that I'm working on. But that's a very, very important question and I haven't seen a very... Um, a response that I'm comfortable with because of my upbringing too. I want to dial that in a little bit more and see if I can come up with something that will satisfy even myself because you're right. There's a lot of people, but the only thing I could think of, as I've said so far, is every denomination should have a small percentage of people speaking in tongues. So because that's not true, then God doesn't have favorites. And I know, Ruben, I have uh, to answer your question too, Ruben, about that Romans passage. And I think that has more to do with God's sovereignty and his selection of Israel and so on and so forth. But I can't remember off the top of my head. So I'll reserve that for next week. So great questions. And you guys are making me work tonight. So anything else? A little bit easier, like maybe how to be born again or something. If not, we let's okay. Let's. I think uh, what Ruben is saying is because he uh, uh, was he was a disobedient. Ruben was. You know, I uh, the question that Ruben is asking mm -hmm. because he thinks that that's a great issue. Yeah. But because of what uh, is it, George or Romans nine thirteen. I forgot the name. Yeah, that's okay. I'll save it for next week so that we can save on the time here. But, um, yeah, we finished the study, which is good. I don't think this is favoritism in the sense that he violates what he said, Ruben. I, I'd like to delve back into the context a little bit more, into the chapter. And if I have to, I'll check in the Old Testament. Because I, I've noticed in, in the past, and I, this happens even among uh, my colleagues and pastor friends of mine, we would say something, we knee-jerk reaction, we know the answer, and then we find out later on that no, maybe not, we need to delve a little bit more. And so I've, I've discovered that sometimes when I answer too quickly, I find out that I'm wrong. So let me get the context, let me delve back in a little bit more, make sure I answer your question fairly, because on the surface, it does look like there's favoritism here. But there is a sovereignty um, component, I believe, that's in here. And I just can't put my finger on it, so let me just dig back a little bit and see what I can come up with. So I can add. Freddie? Yes, uh, yes. Freddie. Yes, Karen? Um, Gladys' mic is not working, but she put something in the text. Oh, she and did? Oh, she did? Okay, let me see. Um... Uh, anthropopathism, which God is using to show human emotion, it's not that God hates Esau. This verse is used to identify what God is trying to say in human accommodation. Okay, good job, Gladys. I, I remember the anthropopathism. And yeah, that's that I think is part of the answer too. And I think there also, I can't seem to put my finger on it. I think there's something as well that goes back a little bit more um, aside from that, I, I think that is a, lang uh, a word of accommodation, but uh, something is telling me that there's something a little bit more It goes back in time. So I will keep that answer. Let me snap this and give you the credit for that anthropopathism, but I also want to, I think there's something else that's behind this, and I, I, I do believe there is. Let me just save what you put here. I like that a lot. I think what you're referring to, Pastor Freddy, is that chapters 9, 10, and 11 is referring back to the Jews. Yes. Correct? Yes. 
And that's why I'm saying there's something that I need to f- uh, pull out from, uh, I can't remember what book it is, but I think there's something there that re- refers to Israel. So I'd like to do a little research on that. Do you, do you remember anything on this, Karen? Sorry, no, not off the top of my you, head. I just know that those three chapters yeah, it re- to the Jews or Israel, and right. so it has to be taken in that context. Yeah, and, and I, I think there is something there because I, I, for something in the back of my head is kind of reminding me about Israel for some reason. Israel, Israel, Israel keeps popping up. So I'd like to uh, look into it before I uh, come up with anything aside from the anthropopathism. I, I do believe that's part of it, but I do think there's something else as well. So Gladys, thank you for that. That's a very heavy word that's not often used among some uh, Bible classes. So... Uh huh. Because he said in in but Jesus because Jesus Christ mm-hmm. itself says in Matthew fifteen twenty four. Mm-hmm. Matthew fifteen twenty four. Yeah, because he said in Matthew fifteen twenty four. But he answered and said, Jesus Christ was speaking here, mm-hmm. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so with that, only about the, the Israel then and Gentiles and I'm, I'm, I'm confused on this one, Pastor. Well, on that one, that's a completely different context. <laughs> Very good observation because he came to save his people. So that's why John the Baptist, you'll notice that, uh, repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he was reaching out to his people. When you see in Matthew 10, I believe, he tells the apostles to go to the lost sheep of Israel. In fact, well, let's see. I'd rather let, let's save that for the observation text for next Tuesday. Okay, okay, Pastor. Because I want to close on a good time since we did finish on time. Now we're going over time. But let's remind me on that, Reuben, for Roman uh, Matthew 10. Okay, because the, Matthew, yeah, 24, Pastor. Yeah, that one and Matthew 10. Okay. Yeah, um, because those two link together. And I'll show you that Jesus came to save the lost sheep of Israel. And then I'll also have an answer for the Romans 9 passage. So, okay. okay. So, so Daddy, yes. I'm sorry. That's okay, Susan. Uh, I know we run out of time, but mm-hmm. maybe we can discuss it uh, mm-hmm. next week sure. or whenever we can. Okay. But it's going to be off the topic. Okay. Um, I had attended the Sunday service probably like two Sundays ago, mm-hmm. and you weren't teaching. You were you weren't teaching at that time, but the pastor mentioned about multiple kingdoms. Oh, that was now, uh, Mike Talbot. Yeah, I mean, I've been with you for mm-hmm. years and years, mm-hmm. and I know you always emphasize that there's only one kingdom, the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. But on that service, he mentioned he mentioned like multiple kingdoms. So, yes. You know, I'm gonna either text you on that to get clarification, and mm-hmm. we can discuss it. In some of the well, you know, if you come back next Tuesday, I'll address it because that's part of the Matthew 10 passage. Uh, the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And so I know where he's going with that. And there are multiple kingdoms. And I'll explain that next Tuesday. So very, and, and I will explain what he means by that. Okay. Sounds good? Okay. okay. Well, you guys all have to come back next Tuesday. And I'll, I have a number of things to explain. And uh, we'll have a good time. That'll be our observation for next Tuesday. So instead of flashing a verse... I'll just clarify some things that we've discussed tonight. Okay, we had a lot of good interaction, a lot of good questions, 
And so our opening for next Tuesday will address these verses here. Okay, sound good? All right, so why don't we close in prayer and then we'll resume this next week. Or you can join me Wednesday uh, at National Capitol at the link that I've sent before. And then I will also see you on Tuesday or Sunday if you join me at National Capitol. So let's close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we are grateful when we can assemble together to talk about your word. Your word is the only thing that brings stability. We saw recently how our former president was nearly assassinated. So truly, life is but a vapor. So life can end at any time. And so that's all the more reason why we need to be proactive in uh, advancing the cause of Christ. We just don't know when we will go or we don't know when our loved ones or friends will go. And so that's the reason why we are active in participating in advancing your cause. So thank you, Father, for the opportunity for us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We know how important this is. It's vital for not only our spiritual life, but the glorification of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who paid it all so that we might have life everlasting by simply believing in Christ or receiving Christ. So we thank you, Father, for this time. We ask now that you would go before us, keeping us all safe and healthy until we meet again. We ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good night, everyone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. I'll see you, Pastor. Okay, bye-bye, Robert.